you've done some incredible things in your life, but it all kind of has to start somewhere. We're thinking, why hasn't someone done this before? Are we missing something? Because this seems like an obvious solution to a big problem. We should absolutely be encouraging businesses to take on the world, but why can't they take on the world from Australia? We've essentially gone viral because of a virus. We saw daily sales double one day and then 12x the day after that. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of People Building Businesses, the podcast by YB Adventures. On this episode, we've got a very special guest with us. He's a returning guest, and when we first interviewed Ben Fister two years ago, he was the head of Square Asia Pacific, where we spoke about how he's managed to bring and grow and scale one of the world's hottest fintech companies here in Australia and beyond. Today, Ben is the co-founder and CEO of Zeller, one of Australia's fastest growing startups. They've managed to raise over $20 million pre-product, which is incredible by all measures. Uh, And they've just launched a product to market, which is also amazing, uh, in the span of just 12 months. In this episode, we're going to talk to Ben about how he came up with the idea of Zeller, how he managed to so successfully grow, scale, and raise funding for his company in just 12 months, and what his thoughts are on fintech and plans for the future. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Ben... Firstly, thank you so much for being back on the podcast. The last time we spoke was in uh, 2019, and a lot has changed in the world since then, obviously. It has, it has. And uh, you, you're wearing a different t-shirt for a different logo now as well, <laughs> which is what we were saying earlier. Correct. Peel the old one off and put the new yep, one yep. on. Uh, <laughs> no, no, actually been exciting 12, 14 months. So, yep. Yeah, awesome. So just a quick recap for the listeners out there. Um, you know, super excited to have Ben Fister on the podcast. Uh, ben is the co-founder of Zeller. Um, one of the hottest and uh, most exciting fintechs to come out of Australia in recent times. Prior to this, Ben was the Australian country manager and and, uh, head of APAC for Square, um, a role which he led pretty impressively um, and and grown over here. And, you know, he's been absolutely tremendous in growing Square. Um, Before that, he was part of the team that launched Jetstar in Australia, um, was also part of the team um, and led the team that um, implemented Visa PayWave here in Australia as well to become one of the leading um, contactless payments markets in the world. So impressive CV and history um, and you know now a co-founder of your own company, Ben. So welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. And your intros are always way too generous, but <laughs> thank, thank <laughs> hey, you. you. You deserve the intros. So I, I, I have so many questions. It's been what, 12 months? 14 months since you founded Zeller and yep. you've had some pretty amazing growth. Um, you know, you've raised over 30 million Australian dollars up to a team of 70. You've launched a financial product into the market in, you know, a year. That's crazy. Um, before we dive into that, uh, I think a good place to start is right at the beginning of Zeller's history, actually. So what sparked the idea for Zeller in your head? Uh, it's a culmination of a few things, but definitely, um, obviously, as you so eloquently put, uh, I've been in the industry for a while. Uh, so it's just seeing the opportunities over the years. And there's a few things that we just saw there was a massive gap for businesses in the business banking space in general, mm. um, particularly deep into financial services. So not going off into other things like SaaS products. So uh, if you look at the the business banking space in Australia, it's still so tightly held by the incumbents. There's four very big banks which dominate pretty much every metric. Um, you see some new international players. Obviously, one's my former employer. Yep. Um, but the combination of the opportunity to actually do something different for Australian businesses and do it locally. So we actually know the market better than anyone else being local. Uh, and we know we can build a team, which is pretty amazing. So that was the first part of it. Um, yeah, we just sort of the founding team had a look at the opportunity and said, listen, what we're talking about doing is going to be ridiculously hard. Like it's, there's a reason people haven't taken on this challenge in pretty much any markets and the way we have is because it's hard. Um, but we thought if we can get the right capital and the right people and you know the right motivation uh, and put it all together, we thought we had a pretty good chance of making it work. So how long was this idea brewing in your head before you actually stepped away from Square to, to launch it? Because for the external observer, it, it seems like it happened almost overnight. I'm sure that's not the case for you, though. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I, I'm passionate about building businesses in general, and I got a great opportunity uh, with Square. Um, so I enjoyed that process. But... Uh, I was still keen. I was always sort of knew there was another chapter coming in terms of building Australian business, and you know, um, with an amazing team here, I've obviously built up a lot of contacts over the years. And mm. the opportunity, I don't think, was being addressed by anyone in this space. So, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it, I mean, I wouldn't say I was hatching the idea for that long, but um, yeah, when I was moving on from from Square, um, 
yeah, the idea came to the fore and I started fleshing it out a bit more and talking to a few people and it was literally just one step after the other and just kept moving from an idea and then here we are. Right, so you decided to leave Square before you started the company. It wasn't sort of a, I did it and then I decided to, to No, leave. no, definitely. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, running a business like Square and many of the businesses that I've been involved with is a, is a full-time yeah. thing, literally uh, full-time. Yep. So you just don't have the ability to start doing side projects like this. That definitely was an opportunity. So. Yep. Uh, yeah, it was clearly afterwards. If you don't mind me asking, when do you realize it was time to move on from from Square after having led that company to you know amazing growth here in Australia? Yeah, it was it was it was very hard. It was. Um, I mean, when you to the first person in market and you grow it up and you know you personally hire everyone in the yeah. team. It's it it does it's a bad phrase, but it feels like your baby, and it's something that I was very very attached to. Uh, both professionally and personally so but you know towards the end i spent there for six years towards the end it was what am i going to do next you know can i keep going with this and um and square had changed dramatically and globally it changed from the company i joined there was 300 odd people and uh, globally which is still quite big but um Mm. uh uh, and at the start there was amazing talent leading the business like francois spruger and and sarah fryer and these people i learned so much from uh, and towards the end, um, you know, it happens with all companies at scale. There's, I think, 5,000 people globally or something yeah. crazy. Um, and just the, the people were different. The mindset was different. Um, so it, was, it came to a point where, you know, to be honest, some of the decisions that um, San Francisco was making was impacting the way I ran the business right. and, and, and the way I ran the team and something that I, f- I firmly believed was the right way to do it. Um, so there was a few signs there saying it was probably a, a nice time to, you know, put a bookend on it and, and, yeah. and move on. So... Um, yeah, it was, it was definitely hard. Though. I mean, yeah. don't, don't get me wrong. I love the business. I still do. So. so, I mean, like you've held some pretty large roles in pretty large companies. Um, what was it like transitioning from that to being a startup founder? Was the experience of it, you know, what you expected? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, with Kinetic and then Square, they were both very different businesses. But that was, I think last time we talked about yep. this, that feeling of opening that laptop on day one and mm. just going, uh-oh, what, what do we do from here? Um, I, I, I just love that. I love that. I love that thrill. And having the ability to have sort of started those, both those businesses to, to varying degrees, mm. it does it does give you that foresight of the stages you're going to have to go through, what you have to do to get started. So doing it again, it didn't feel big. It yep. didn't feel um, like a dangerous or risky thing. It felt very natural. Uh, and this time doing it with a bunch of people who I immensely respect made it you know, so much easier. Um, and to be honest, it happened really fast. I don't think I really had the chance to think and worry about yeah. it. Um, we certainly looked at it and went, this is stupendously hard what we're going to do. But then we <laughs> just didn't think again until we were starting it. So Yeah. So, I mean, you've crammed so much into 12 months or, you know, 14 months now, I guess, since you found it. I don't know what the exact date in which you started. It's about company. that. Yep. About there. Yeah. I mean, you've worked with, you know, the necessary financial regulations. You worked around that to launch, you know, a business banking product. Uh, you've raised capital. You've hired. You've launched a product. Um, validated model. I mean, how did you do all, how did you cram all that into such a short time frame? I mean, there's only one Ben, oh, I, know. I think at least. Yeah, no, there's definitely, thank God there's only one of me. But um, <laughs> no, no, I mean, obviously it goes without saying it's it's a team that did it. It's definitely yep. not me. Um, uh, and that's something that we were very strong on. And I learned firsthand at Square is that, you know, you are the sum of the people that you're working with and that's, it you know, has to be done. So we're very lucky that it was literally within the first week of us even getting together where, we're having, I was having a conversation with Square Peg and they were talking about investing. So mm. it, it wasn't much time to actually worry about how we're going to put it together. And then the second you have suddenly this commitment of you know, $6 million, it's, it's like, oh, okay, we can take that first step straight away. We can start hiring talent. We can start scaling. We can start building. And um, yeah, so it's, we just didn't get that opportunity to stop back and reflect and worry about how big it was going to be before we just started it. Yeah. So, so tell me more about the Square investment because they put in about 6.3 mil AUD uh, in, I think it was June of last year. How did that come about? Was it literally as you described, just a conversation and they kind of went, oh, we, we like this team. We like the idea and here's some seed funding to get it off the ground. Uh, it was kind of similar to that, but I think some of the... We kind of misled the market a little bit when we announced it. So okay. <laughs> uh, we don't believe in announcing raises that obvious. Like we don't, that's not an end state. That's not success. Mm. It's just the fuel you need to start. So yep. we actually raised that. The conversation with Square Peg started like literally the first or second week of January. Um, right. And we had the term sheet within, I think, 10 days. So it was very, very quick from the outset. Uh, I actually messed up the announcement. So I thought after... <laughs> Like we said, let's get on with building the business, and then COVID hit from the, pretty much the outset, and it didn't feel right to talk about you know 
how great it is to raise money. The businesses that would be our customers were, were suffering and they were struggling. So yeah. any form of celebration or announcement of PR just felt tone deaf. I, yeah, yeah, I messed up the um, thinking that coming out of lockdown 1.0 in Melbourne, as you'd recall, Ooh, uh, yeah. was somehow the end of COVID, uh, yep. which it clearly wasn't. Um, <laughs> so we thought, what a great time to announce. We announced it. And then the week later, we went back yep. into <laughs> Back in stage four. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so we actually raised it really early. The, the original premise was to self-fund that first few sort of weeks, months, whatever it took to get some sort of concept going. But um, uh, yeah, actually, the... Um, uh, Mike Starkey, who's from Athena Home Loans, um, is actually a neighbour of my brother. Um, ah. And they were talking and whatever, and he was, my brother was mentioning that I was starting this new business and he was interested in catching up and having a talk about it. Um, and I was interested in catching up with him because he was doing obviously great things with yeah, Athena. Great and now, company. Great company yeah. and, uh, and great team as well. Um, so I asked to catch up with him and uh, started just, we hadn't actually pitched the business to anyone. We just like everyone that we talked to were people that were already committed to the business or mm. working there. And having a chat to him at the very outset and hearing yourself talk about the business uh, was great for me and to pick his brain. But then he immediately said, well, why are you self-funding? Why don't you go and speak to the VCs? And I was, wasn't sure about it. And he said, well, listen, if you do, let me know. And I came back to him and said, okay, I will. Who do you recommend? And uh, he said, Paul at Square Peg and, um, and Alex uh, at, at uh, Apex Capital as well. And that were the first two conversations I ever had. And um, wow. that was the first week of January. And pretty much both of them uh, in that first meeting they may not have given us a term sheet in their first meeting, but they did everything other than commit. Like they were saying, well, we, we love this, we love this premise, we love what you're doing, we love the team you're putting together. We think there's a great opportunity here we want to invest. So, um, you know, touch wood, very, very privileged to have that. I'm very privileged. Um, but yeah, we've had a bit of a, we had a great start. Yeah. yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that's sort of like the dream scenario for a lot Definitely. of startups. I mean, w looking back, what do you attribute that success to? Was it, you know, your the combination of, you and your team's experience? Was it, you know, the the idea itself? Um, you know, was it a combination of the two, um, the chemistry between you and the VCs? What would you distill it down to in terms of your success in being able to do that? The answer is in your question. <laughs> you okay, summed sure. it up better than I probably I could. Um, but yeah, it was a combination of the track record of the founding team. Yeah. Then it wasn't, we didn't just, uh, we weren't a bunch of kids that just woke up yep. and said, hey, let's get into this cool <laughs> sector, which is fintech. We'd seen it. We, we'd identified the opportunity. It was there. Everything that we wanted to build from the start, we kind of knew how to do it. We knew how to scale a business and build a brand, build infrastructure. We knew the challenges we we're going to have to face. We knew the hurdles we'd have to overcome and things we have to get right. Um, it was definitely the experience was a big part of it. Um, it was also the way we were putting it together. So mm. if you look at or you know, there's a plethora of neo banks around the world, yep. or less so in the business banking space, but there's still some. But they all tend to be putting a like a nice, pretty app or a card on a BAS platform, mm. um, and chasing an interchange play. And for us, that didn't seem quite right. We thought every business needs something more than that, and that's only one part of the equation. So how do we go in the middle? How do we become that main financial institution? Right. And for us, was to say, well, they need to accept money. They need to put it somewhere and then they put it to good work and fast as they can. And can we do all those three things better than everyone's doing it in one simple solution? So definitely the the way we're approaching it resonated with them. Um, and also the timing. Like, it seems weird. I'm not going to celebrate COVID at all. But mm. uh, in years being in fintech, I never thought that uh, a pandemic would kill cash. But it was kind of what. So uh, businesses needed help like this. They needed better banking solutions. They needed better payment solutions. They needed it faster and cheaper, easily look after their businesses. So I think that premise uh, actually sits well with a lot of investors saying mm. there's a big opportunity in it's a combination of what we're offering, obviously, yep. gelled well to what they're thinking. Yeah, and th there is a bit of controversy around new banks these days, as you mentioned, because, you know, some of them have failed. Um, you know, we had the CEO of 86400 on the podcast as well, um, and they've recently sold. So, I mean, th the future of new banking is quite mixed at the moment. Um, you know, where do you think it's heading towards and, you know, how is Zeller shaping that perception in the market? Uh, yeah, I mean, on one hand, you, it's, there is not a more exciting time for mm. neo banks and financial services businesses around the world. Majority, I don't know this statistically, but so much investment is going into fintech, which I think is amazing. It's such a big opportunity. There's still that whole incumbent ecosystem that needs disruption, needs improvement, needs enhancement. So yeah. the fact that so much capital is going there is great, um, but it is hard. Like building a bank is not an easy, frivolous little thing to to build. So yeah, um, yeah in the Australian industry, I kind of have mixed feelings about that. I'm you know thrilled for eighty six four hundred and the team behind that that they they've got to the point that they could make 
at the exit or the move that they thought was right for their business. But on one hand, I love watching them grow and scale, and I really hope they'd really you know, force their brand into the fore and by themselves. But you know, hopefully, they can go strength to strength with this new partnership. Um, we don't take any excitement or pleasure in seeing Neobanks fail. I think that's uh, you know, credit to them for for setting out on that journey. As I said, it's hard, and so. Yeah. You got to get a lot right to make it work. So that you know, it's not exciting to see things like Zinja not work. Uh, and obviously, Vault looked at another opportunity and moved. So net net, there's actually not many anymore, which um, I think is disappointing because mm. the opportunity still still exists. Is the challenge with regulation, you think, or something else? Um, there's definitely a bit of that. I think. Um, I mean, regulation we know is there for the right reasons. It should be there. There's such important thing moving money around. So you can't take that lightly. So. Um, but there's no doubt. There's no doubt that there's a there's an absolute missing element of competition in the Australian broader banking and financial services space. So, when you look at trying to help neo banks or startups or any sort of financial services new ent- entries coming into the market, you need to give them an unfair advantage. You need to make sure that they can survive in those early days because it's really hard. It's complicated. The pr- pr- processes are slow. You know, to break through and to grab the consumer's attention or business attention is hard. So. I definitely think there could be more done in helping those businesses get established first. Yep. Uh, and that's you know partly regulation, partly support, tax incentives, motivation, employment incentives, you know, uh, all the way through you need to help these businesses because the competition is just not there and we need to see it yeah. come through. I mean, speaking of early days, for Zeller, it, it is still early days for the company. Very much so, yep. uh, You know, what was the, what were the first 12 months like for you? You know, raising money, building product, building team, like, could you describe that experience for us? Um, yeah, it's it's been an absolute thrill. Like yeah. it's uh, it's been such a I mean for everyone such a ridiculously weird year twenty twenty. Um, yeah. But that's what we were born into. So we didn't know any 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 better or different. Like Zello was founded during those circumstances and grew from there. So it yeah. it wasn't weird for us. But uh, there was a lot of upside to doing that, where you could you could suddenly raise money you know, over a call or over, over a Zoom or something. <laughs> yeah. And you, you didn't have to wait to fly out there. Yeah. And do, so so the cap raise processes have been really fast. The ability to jump on VCs and talk uh, video conferencing and talk yeah. to anyone is really easy. So our hiring was fast. Also, a lot of the people that we wanted to hire and people that came to us, I think COVID made them rethink their careers and going, well, am I in the right place? Is this what I want? You know, and you, we all had a lot of time to reflect. So yeah. hiring was weirdly easier than we expected as well. Um, and also, you know, taking out travel time, being focused on building, we actually got a lot done in a short amount of time. Okay. So, um, yeah, the COVID's not good, but the environment it created was actually an accelerant to our mm. business. So, yeah. what about on the product side of things? Because you typically need to collaborate on, you know, I mean, you've launched a bunch of products, and we'll dive into that later. But how, what was your approach to actually building the product and testing it during COVID? Yeah, um, we're a little bit different in this front, where we don't believe in over testing it. Mm. Um, we're pretty strong that we know the industry well. We've we've worked in different businesses that kind of look at different parts of the equation. And we believe that our vision was solid. So it was about getting on with it and just building that. It was less about testing to see if it was right. We, we were confident that it would work. And right. I think if you're going to move that fast, you have to have that confidence and you have to back yourself. You have to back your team that they can execute on it. So we just got on with it and we just built it. Yep. Um, uh, and, and along the way, you'd start iterating and start asking a little questions and, and you know changing. And it did definitely change from the start to the to the end. Yeah. Uh, but for the best, for sure. But no, we were very quick on that. We didn't waste a lot of time. Yeah, I guess that speaks to your experience having done this in the past, and yeah. y- you know what to do. It's it's not your first rodeo for you and your team. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. And bringing the right people in to complement our, our our gaps, which, yeah. which we had plenty of. So. Uh, and just, you know, the talent that we've brought in has been insane. Like it's yeah. an incredible amount of talent in, in, in Zell already. I mean, almost 70 people and uh, to the person, they're, they're amazing. Um, so yeah, yeah we, we obviously relied on them as we scale as well. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, you, you keep mentioning team, team, team. And, you know, that that's pretty incredible to, to acknowledge that it takes a group of people to, to build a product. I mean, what, what's your approach to building a team? What How do you define a good team? Um, that's a very, very long conversation. Um, yeah. uh, for me, I... I it's a bit hard when you're starting it. You've got your fingerprints over everything. So everything you're doing, like with the, the first, whether it was two of us and then four of us, and then up and up, mm. like you have to own everything. You're literally doing all the work. So when people come on, there is this little bit of a handover process where you go, like, I, like I know you're good, I know you're talented, 
but I'm not just going to say, hey, just go and build it and come back in a month or go and create this or write this. It's like, let's do it together. And then as you build confidence in each other and because you're still creating stuff, you're creating a brand, you're creating a product, you're creating a design ethos, all sorts of things. And just as people come on, you just work closely together, really hand in hand in the early stages. And then when that confidence is there, which with our team happened really quickly, you start stepping back um, mm-hmm. all the way from you know doing everything yourself to now we're at where there's things, just amazing things happening every day, which you don't even know about it anymore. You right. hear about it after it. Um, but I think that's that, that you build the trust on an individual level of building a team. Um, and I think all the, the leads that we've brought in who are hiring people, the same approach to say, let's work together, let's collaborate. Everyone has their hands, gets their hands dirty. There's no one sitting back and just managing. We're all building this together. And yeah, it's that rapport builds, that trust builds, and then you sort of hand it off and you keep growing from there. Yeah, that's awesome. And how how do you identify a bad hire? I mean, especially because you're hiring so quickly as well. And, you know, I, I presume there's little margin for error given that you're growing so quickly. So how do you identify a bad hire? Yeah, I, I, I know you don't mean anything bad at, yeah. bad by this, but I think there's a bad hire. Like yeah. I, I think everyone we've hired has been amazing, yep. very talented yep. and very aligned. Not all of them work out. Mm. Um, that's not often because they're, they're bad or they're, they're not good at their job. It's just what it takes to do what we're doing yep. is really hard. And it takes a really driven sort of person that um, uh, it, it's more than a job to them. They actually want to, you know, it's, it's everything they're doing at the time. And they're not from a time perspective, but from an emotion perspective and a profession perspective. And some people, that's just not where they're at. Um, and so, yeah, we haven't parted ways with many people at all. That's awesome. uh, but when it happens, it, I think it happens for mutual reasons. Cause, yeah. yeah we, if anyone fails in the business, we all fail. And that's what happens in a startup. You've all got to be firing. You've all got to be mm. delivering. So. Awesome. So jumping to the product now, could you tell us a bit more about what Zeller does? Sure. Um, as I touched on before, it brings yep. those three things together that every business needs. So they mm. need to accept payments. And yep. despite the massive attention that people put on Card Not Present or e-commerce with the likes of Stripe and Arjun and Braintree, who are amazing, um, but face-to-face transactions is growing faster than it ever has. It's yep. displacing cash. It's still the majority of transactions, but it's been neglected. Um, so we thought to ourselves, can we build um, you know, card acceptance terminals, FPOS machines that are way better than the clunky looking ones you would see around today with the tiny screens and little green writing on it. Um, can we build something that's easier to set up, something more intuitive, beautiful design where you can click a button and add buy now, pay later, mm. or, or, or add accounting or add uh, pause services? Can you get better information? Can you manage site access? Can you do all sorts of things on that terminal? Can you do it at a better rate? Can you do it at a better cost? Can you do it faster? Can you make the thing look better so mm. it complements design? Uh, and due to our background more than anything, yeah, we know how to build payments business. We know if we could build terminals, we know how we'd build them. So we're confident on that. So we built uh, a terminal, but that's part of the equation. They still need somewhere to put their money. So we then built uh, a transaction account, mm. a business transaction account. And the third party of part of getting that money in, putting it somewhere is actually putting it to work to mm. solve cash flow issues, which every business face at some point. Um, so we can, we put a business MasterCard on that. And we literally took those three products, which we think every business needs, and put them together, literally in a box, yep. which you can buy from Officeworks. A nice black box I, I saw. So. Yeah, black or white. Yep. Uh, you can pick black whatever aesthetics cool. you want. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, and literally everything comes in that box. So yep. if you're a business getting started, you, you've got everything you need to get started. If you're a business growing, opening a new location, you yep. can do it. If you're a business thinking of moving from an incumbent provider or stopping cobbling together these various solutions, you want an all-in-one solution, um, you can get it in this box. Um, so it's it's physical, it's literal, uh, but it's also really convenient to actually get that up and running. Um, that's the first part of it, yep. uh, making sure they can get access to that and they can scale their business and they can try Zell. That's incredible. I mean, each product on its own, if this was any other company, would take 12 months to launch to market. You've done three of that yeah. in 12 months. I mean, again, I keep going back to this question, like how did you do it? Like, uh, it, it, I don't think we have a <laughs> chance to reflect uh, and <laughs> yeah. go, how did that happen? Um, we do have as team, we do have pinch me moments now and again and just go, wow. Like, I don't yep. <laughs> because another thing we did is we didn't just, I said, we didn't just put it on a bass platform. We yep. didn't just do the, the, the wrapper layer on the top and, and call it ours. Um, we've got a very small number of partners in all that ecosystem. Um, and we build a lot of our own infrastructure, our own risk engines, our, a lot of our own onboarding tools. And so, um, yeah, it, it seems ridiculously hard, like there's like two, an issuing and acquiring bank effectively, um, but we build a lot of infrastructure ourselves. So mm. um, no, there's only one answer, it's just talent. It's yeah. just an amazing team. That's just Find the right team and everything takes care of itself. 
Yeah, kind a little, of. <laughs> little bit more than that, but uh, no, it is. It's, it's the right people and the people yeah. that want to do it. Like they're so passionate about all of them. Yep. All of them. This is not a job to them. This yeah. is something that they believe in and something they're committed to. So it helps. Yeah, awesome. And we've got Josh here from your team sitting on the side as well. We Cameras did. can't see him, but uh, you know he's here supporting you as well, which is awesome and speaks to the team you have, I guess. Yeah. No, very talented part of the yep. team. And obviously we worked together in the past. So yep. uh, a big part of this business is actually bring together new talent that we've yep. never met before and compliment mm. the team. But it is unashamedly bring the best people we've worked with before. Yeah. So yeah, happy to do that. So Zeller is obviously a new name in the market right now. You've officially launched in May 2021. Uh, how did how do you compete with the people that are currently in market? What differentiates Zeller? Because you've got, like you said, you know, Square, you've got the big four banks, and you've got all these other neo banks as well that you're competing against. So what's your strategy there to take on the current incumbents in market? Uh, yeah, one part of it is um, access to make sure people can find our products. Mm. And so the partnership with Officeworks is where we're thrilled to have, you know. Yep. Uh, particularly when banks are withdrawing from regional Australia and they've got you know amazing footprint of branches around around the country. So the fact that anyone can walk into an office work store and take the Zeller kit and get started or grow their business is massively important to us. Yeah, um, a big part of it, but also it comes down to growth and branding. As a like we we back our product and we think when people are going to use it, they're going to love it. Um, but they have to hear about it. And so you, it, it's not a small thing to start building a brand from scratch. Um, so a big part of it is making sure that initial marketing and comm strategy is spot on. But hopefully, I don't know if you've seen any of our marketing material and our ads and builds, they're different. Like they don't look like what a bank, not that we're a bank, yep. but they don't look like uh, what a bank ad would look like. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it. The music's not like it. The movement's not like it. The personality's not like a bank. So you have to stand out. You have to look different. You have to be different. Um, but also you have to d deliver on that. So, um, you know, we're not going to be perfect in the early days, but when people speak to someone at Zeller and you speak to our amazing customer success success team, you know, you're speaking to someone who is is an owner in the business, mm. is passionate about it and understands the struggles of Australian businesses and what they need. Um, so, yeah, even since we've launched, like, the feedback's amazing, like the absolutely incredible the way they talk to us and uh, the feedback from our CS team is, is super strong and people are shocked. Like, oh my right. God, I actually called you and I could speak to you straight away and you helped me. We're actually getting these really weird things where we're getting a lot of customers of the big banks calling up our call center wow. saying, I can't get help with my ex bank um, terminal. Um, can you help me? And we were just like, why are these people calling us? And and we started <laughs> to understand it's actually really hard to just speak to someone and this stuff can be complicated. When businesses grow or start, their expertise is not in financial services and, and it shouldn't be. So they're not getting the support that they need. And uh, yeah, so we've loved being able to actually help them as much as we yeah. can. Um, and if we can't help them, we just tell them they should come to Zeller anyway. So, Do you think you're going to be able to maintain that level of customer service and customer focus as you keep growing? It'll change. There's no doubt. Mm. It, it, it's not scalable. We'll just keep throwing uh, you know, resources at it. But I think you can do it. I think you mm. can do it if you do it cleverly. Um, you have to keep growing those, make sure self-onboarding is simple, make sure self-service is simple, mm. make sure the information is there. So you look at the way we do things, like one of the most common questions you get is how much is this going to cost me? And you look at all the incumbents' websites, it's impossible. Even <laughs> I worked in this industry for years. I yep. still don't know what they're charging people. <laughs> um, but you look at our website, it's on the front page. Yeah, It's very clear. And we've got one rate, one price to get the kit, and that's it. If there's, yep. there's nothing else. There's no hidden charges. Um, so that you then take volume away from that customer support. Making onboarding as seamless as possible, as simple as it can be. It's hard, onboarding businesses, but constantly improving that is important too. So hopefully the simplicity of our products sort of uh, helps diminish the requirement for support over time. Yeah. I forgot to ask this when we started the podcast. Uh, how did you come up with the name Zeller? Because it, it is quite a different name to what you see in market. Yeah, I'd probably love a better story. <laughs> I thought we should make one up. It's better. <laughs> um, anyone that started a business, if you literally try to start a fintech, yep. take any word, any derivative of a word, and put it in Google and search for the domain name, it's gone. It's taken somewhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, but when we were thinking about trying to, what the name needs to be, it was always came back to the same thing. It has to represent the businesses that we're here to serve. Like it has to be. And then you find yourself being cliche to talking about just businesses or whatever. Um, so for us, our, our focus, our reason for being is for merchants, otherwise known as sellers. Um, so it was just a derivative on that to say we want our customers being in our name represent somehow, but we don't want to literal. So it was a little play on the word seller. I mean, that's a pretty good story. So it kind of makes oh, sense. I'll as stick well. with it then. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, so 
you you raised the seed funding in Square, with Squarepeg uh, June oh, early 2020. Um, you've also recently raised a Series A uh, late 2020. I think it was 25 million AUD with a number of investors yeah. like you know Squarepeg uh, reinvesting obviously Apex Capital Partners uh, addition. Uh, wh- what what was different about the Series A versus the seed? Um, did you find that it was a similar process, or did you have to do things differently to approach that Series A? Um, and I'm so sorry if this sounds in any way arrogant. I'm yeah. really not supposed to because I know how lucky we are with yep. the raise, but we weren't raising for A. Like, we had no intention of raising. It mm. wasn't around. We weren't, like, we still had millions of dollars to spend. Like, we literally hadn't scaled fast enough to spend the six wow. million. Okay. Um, uh, but at the time, uh, we got a bit of publicity. Yep. Uh, and then, obviously, I think a lot of people actually saw that as something that they were interested in, in the space and the, the formula which we talked about. Um, so actually Lee from Edition, who was just starting his own own fund, um, uh, he happened to be Googling people that had been at Square for many years and had left to go and start their own business because he was one of the early investors in Square. Um, and he literally just happened to be Googling me at the same week that we had some press, local press. Yeah, uh, right. He reached out. Um, he's an amazing investor. He understands the space really well. The conversation was extremely pointed and straight to, you know, tell me what it's about, what about this, this, and this. And then he got to that level of comfort really quickly. And uh, we had term sheets in five days. Wow. So it was, yeah. Uh, fast. Very, very fast. Um, and credit to um, Apex Capital and Square Peg Capital who invested when we were just a, literally an idea. Uh, they leaned in again and took full pro rata. So it was, um, wow. it was super easy round and we were very privileged to have the type of investors that we've had. And uh, that was actually, yeah, mid last year that we did that. So. Yeah, awesome. Just a couple more questions before we wrap up because I'm a bit conscious of timing. I'm sure you're busy. Um, <laughs> oh, good. And we appreciate you being on the podcast. Uh, COVID, uh, I, I got to ask you about COVID because it's obviously impacted a lot of your customers yep. um, and you know the industry in general. So I mean, wh- what have you seen happen over the last 12 months in the industry and where do you think it's going to head towards post-COVID? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's obviously this industry that we work in, but more, I think you're asking more around the businesses that we serve. Mm. And, and it goes without saying they were decimated last year. Yep. It was awful to watch and awful to see. You know, we're all in the city now and you walk around and you still see a lot of places closed. So um, it was a terrible year last year. But for us, on the flip side of that, what a great time to actually build a business. And actually go, if our mission wasn't clear at the start of the year before yep. uh, and the opportunity there, Midway through the year when COVID really took hold, it was clearer than ever. And then we're really lucky that it just happened to build, obviously it takes what it takes, but build the product in the time that we did that, you know, touch wood, COVID is now hopefully close to the end. Um, we're actually launching at a time where Australian and then global businesses need what we're offering. Yeah. Like it could not be better. Cash is disappearing. A lot of businesses are getting back on their feet. A lot of businesses are questioning how their incumbent banking providers treated them during COVID. They're looking for something to run their business better. Um, so yeah, we're obviously in a rising tide. Couldn't be a better time for us to launch. And just seeing the entrepreneurial spirit of Australian yeah. businesses is ridiculously exciting. Yeah. And to be able to help them is even better. So what's next for Zeller? What does the next 12 months look like? Yeah, it's probably two gears to that or two paths to that. One, yeah. we're just excited to make sure this product set is out there and as many Australian businesses know about us. Uh, we're already loving seeing the people sign up and loving to seeing it out in the wild is really excited. So we have an obligation and a real excitement to grow that business. Uh, but we've already done the scoping of our next iteration and generation of products. Mm. We don't want to stop at the product set we've got now. We want to go deep into business financial services and there's a range of products that we're already building on at the moment. Uh, They're complicated. They'll take a while. But um, yeah, I promise that we absolutely have it with Zeller and we'll continue to um, uh, reach a commitment on is constant innovation. Like you'll see our products evolve all the time. You'll see next products come out nonstop. Um, And so we're building a really strong team to keep building new products and keep deploying that. So we don't want to stand still. We know there's an opportunity in Australia to really make uh, make a difference and we want to look global as well. And my last question for you, we have a lot of people listening to this podcast who obviously want to start businesses or who have started businesses. If they wanted to learn more about Zeller or get their hands on your product, uh, what should they do? Uh, go to the website, myzeller.com. Um, 
uh, yeah, it's a really intuitive, easy to understand website. You can get a lot of information there. They can call out. Awesome front landing page, by the way. Like, I, I love your landing page. Cool. That's really good you to know. hear. I think uh, it's actually been a strong part of our business. We want to be a, a design-led business. Yep. Um, so thank you for saying that. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, a lot of our assets you think the same way about. Um, uh, yeah, call up our customer support team if you've got any questions. Um, go to the website. Go into Officeworks. I know they're, they're loving the reception they're getting already. So have a chat to their staff and make sure that, you know, hopefully we can provide a service for their business. Awesome. Ben, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's great speaking to you again. And, uh, you know, who knows what the next 12 months will bring. But, you know, we could probably be speaking about you raising 100 mil from <laughs> 12 months from now. So thank you for being on the podcast. No, thanks for having me. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening in. I hope you really enjoyed the podcast with Ben. I've certainly learned a lot from speaking to him, and I hope you did too. If you like the podcast, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, even YouTube. Thanks for tuning in, and see you in the next episode.